Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Blizzard Watch podcast, where we talk about video games and other things, whatever we want. I mean, there was a there was a whole episode where we talked about like literally uh, comic book characters and stuff. So yeah, we talk about a bunch <laughs> of things, but this one's going to be pretty heavily uh, Blizzard oriented, I think, because there's a fair amount of news to discuss for Blizzard and its mini games. Uh, the first one is one that I didn't put in the email, but I wrote the post about it, so I am aware that it happened. Um, Overwatch 2 is, has released the, the way that you will merge your, your accounts across various platforms from, from any consoles that you play it on and your PC as well. It's going to be a full cross-progression game, which they had not originally said, if I'm not wrong. I, yeah, I read- they, they originally did not say there was going to be cross-progression, only cross-play. Yeah. Uh, and the crossplay is what um, it's what current Overwatch has. Like you can play if you play Overwatch on your uh, like on your PlayStation, you can play it with your friend who plays PC, but you will only be matched into groups that are similarly playing on PlayStation and PC. Uh, you will not, you can't do competitive play that way. But that's not going to be the case for Overwatch Two. Overwatch Two is going to be across every every platform. So. The how to do it is not that complicated, but it does take a little bit of reading, and I'm not going to try and like outline it all for you right here. It's more complicated if you try doing it from your your console. It, I would ar- argue that if you have a if you have an Overwatch account that you're using on PC, do it from there because it's conf- much simpler. I'm confused by the the complexity of it, honestly. Yeah, I don't ahead. think it's that complicated personally. <laughs> It's it's not complicated to explain, but it is. It's one of those things where you have to sit there and do like multiple steps. And there's the QR code, and if you have the proper app, well, you can I, scan the QR code. But if you don't, no, you need to I, get the alphanumeric <laughs> code. It's just. I I mean, just if you're doing it from a console, there is a code that you have to enter on your PC to link it to your Battle.net account, which you can do by scanning a QR code. A lot of phones have QR code readers built into them. Windows, or if you do Windows it, Windows has it built in as a base function. Yeah. Yeah. So does iOS. Or if you do it on your PC, you just say you go to your account manager and say, "Okay, I want to connect my Battle.net account to my PlayStation Network account or my Xbox Live account," and you click a button and you log in and you're done. It's you just have to on the console. You just have to get a code that you enter on your PC so the PC knows what your console account is, or the other way around if you're doing it completely that- on your PC. Like it's easy, but like that. My question is, is like I don't understand why you just can't log into your Battle.net account because like that's what like EA does and that's what like Ubisoft does, regardless of what platform you're on already. It's like you just have one account you log into. You don't have to do. You uh, can't do that. But you have link. to tell I mean, it. You you do have just one account to log into. It's what they're doing right now is they're merging console accounts, which have up to now been completely separate. So if you have previously gotten progression on your console, that's the thing. From Overwatch 1 to Overwatch 2, progression is going to carry over. Like all of those cosmetics and things, I'm pretty sure all of that stuff is carrying over into Overwatch 2. Um, Yeah, it's not much different than if you played, like for instance, I played Assassin's Creed Valhalla on both my PC and on my, my Xbox. And I linked it pretty much exactly the way Ubisoft's system is actually exactly like this. Uh, it's not very different at all. You basically, you, you bring, you boot it up on one of the two, you get a code and you put it in on the other, whichever one you're using. Um, it took me like, it took me a little bit, but then I had it and it was pretty much exactly like this. So it's not terribly different, but you know, I, I still don't feel like I'm trying going to be able to try to r- run the whole thing down for you. I mean, the thing is you just, you link your account and then any progression you already have is linked to your Battle.net account. Like if you hadn't been using Battle.net before, and just once your account is linked, you log in with your Battle.net account, and that's it. All right, we'll say one thing to keep in mind. Let's say you've got, for some reason, you have three you have three Blizzard.net accounts on your your PC. I know a lot of people who do. Um, usually for World of Warcraft, actually, not for necessarily for Overwatch, but nevertheless. If that's the case, you need to make sure which accounts you're linking to what. You can't link any of your PC accounts to other PC accounts. So if you have, say, three... PC accounts, you can't link them together, and you can't link your, if you have an Xbox one, you cannot link your Xbox to more than one of the accounts you have on PC. And for that matter, if you have, for some reason, you're playing, you have two different Xboxes, completely different setup, you're playing Overwatch on both, you have to pick which one gets to link to your main account. That's if you have multiple Xbox Live accounts that you're doing, which seems like a very edge case. 
It is. It is extremely edge. But just it is because they are not letting people have a do over. If you accidentally link the wrong account, it's a year cooldown to unlink it. Like you, you can you unlink can, it, but then you can't link a new one for a year. You you can link a new one, but it doesn't copy progression over. Yeah. I mean, I think I think they're trying to prevent people from like stacking up duplicate progression yes. from multiple accounts. Like if you logged mm-hmm. on to your friend's account and you grabbed their progression and then you unlinked it and you logged on to another friend's account. I, I mean, I think they're just trying to do that here. That's that is what I think as well. But just just be aware that that is the case. You can link a uh, switch. PlayStation, both four and five, I believe. Uh, Xbox, the various <laughs> Xboxes that are currently out there, and PC. There's nothing else as of yet. I didn't know Overwatch Two was going to Switch, so that's actually kind of amazing to me. I'm not sure if it will be coming I, out right away. I mean, they're doing a weird thing with Overwatch Two, where Overwatch One and Overwatch Two are kind of the same thing. Yeah, it almost comes I mean, up like an expansion. Yeah, if this were Warcraft, this would be like going from patch 1.0 to patch 2.0. This would not be like Warcraft 2. This is just, uh, you know, this is kind of an expansion pack that's being sold as a new game, which I find really, really confusing. Isn't that... Okay, so maybe I'm misremembering. Please correct me if I'm wrong, but wasn't originally Overwatch 2 going to be a completely new like reworked engine or did they scrap that and just work off the one engine again that i don't know i don't remember hearing yeah. anything about that because i remember they were working on a new engine right they were working on a new thing for overwatch 2 i seem to remember that distinctly i could be taking pills that are making me like misremember things or like there could be something in the water i don't know but like i for whatever reason remember them saying that and then never hearing anything about that again I mean, I don't know if it's going to run on a new engine, but it's like it's like it's two games, but also it's one game and you can keep playing Overwatch one. And I don't know. None of it makes sense to me, frankly. I've never quite understood how it's it doesn't seem like an Overwatch two. It doesn't seem like a new game, just an expansion. But maybe it is that it's just, okay. we're doing this big, exciting new engine. And of course, since Overwatch 2 is free to play, it's, a whole you know, it's the old there's... NBC motto. If you haven't played it, it's new to you. <laughs> uh, I mean, Overwatch 2 is kind of just Overwatch. But, and that's, but two that's of it. really it. But, uh, I mean, it's just, it's just going to be Overwatch. Overwatch is Overwatch. Okay, well, with that somewhat, um, you know, Thomas Hellerian way to put it expressed, I'm like, seriously I... catch 22 y. You know, I think we've really spent this entire conversation just seriously overcomplicating the situation. Yeah, probably. Let's, let's talk about the mobile auction house, <laughs> because that's a thing to talk about. The yeah. uh, mobile auction house is back. They've re- they're have they re-releasing we- it it's today, right? Today is the day that they, they did the patch, and now it should be live, correct? We, we should maybe clarify, leading in, that this is World of Warcraft we've switched to. <laughs> No, uh, just but- figure it out, guys. Guess it from context. <laughs> no, it's it is the World of Warcraft uh, mobile auction house. Uh, but but it, yes, it, it should it's, be. It's now attached to the WoW Companion app because before it was mm-hmm. the WoW Armory app. I think. Wow, that's been so many apps ago. Um, but yeah, it's 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 in. It should be in the game as of now. If, since WoW is up again, you should be able to use the WoW Companion app to do various things on the auction house. One big thing you can't do is list auctions. I honestly don't remember if you could list auctions with the original you, one. You could. Yeah, I used to I, do it all I, the time from work when I was bored. Yeah, it's been long enough that I have not, I did not retain the memory. But you can't do that. You can you can bid on auctions. You can buy out auctions. You can, you know, you can delist your auctions. Uh, but they don't they don't let you list auctions. And I found it was interesting it, when, when we read the post about it, um, the, the, the post that Blizzard did. They basically said that one of the reasons that you, they weren't bringing that back yet is they were playing it safe because in the past, the mobile auction house was used to basically crash servers. Yeah, I remember that, actually. So people would, oh. would hook into the API and like load because uh, you used to be able to split the stacks like you normally would. But you could tell it like if you were doing a stack of let's say you had 100 pieces of cloth in your bank, you could make the mobile app break it down into one stack of one or 100 stacks of one instead of, you know, five stacks of 20. Um, and so people would inundate the API with a whole bunch of transactions and bog it down. And because it was interfacing directly with the servers, kaboom, basically. So with that changed, that's the reason that they haven't currently integrated uh, listing. 
I don't know. They've said that they're they're going to watch how this goes and decide if they're going to bring out any future functionality. I would think the vast majority of people for that that this is something they want will want to be able to list auctions. Um, I know I'm never going to use it. It is not my jam, but I'm positive people that that use it a lot are going to definitely want to be able to list auctions with it. Uh, no idea when we're going to see that. Do either of you like? I mean, do you guys? I, do either of you? Joe just said he used to use it. Did, did you use it, Liz? I've I have never used it before. Um, I know this afternoon the auction house has been having problems and was actually not working on like in the actual game. Uh, earlier today, people were getting the message that the auction house is closed. So I think there may be some technical difficulties going around. Yeah, that tracks. Well, that's Maybe. a good time for me to go and try use an auction house. It's it's patch day, and I have I pulled up the mobile app, and it is giving me an error message whenever I look for anything. So technically, the feature is out, but also it's kind of broken right now. Maybe by the time you hear this podcast, it will be fixed and running lawlessly. Yep, auction house is closed at the moment. Please try again. That's what I'm getting <laughs> as well. So yeah, there you go. But. You know, that's there. That's that is news. I think it, a lot of people wanted that back. So uh, the next thing to talk about is the fated raid of the week, which is the sepulcher of the first ones, um, which I think is important for a lot of reasons. Uh, one of the reasons is that the jelly cat is now available. The jelly cat mount. Uh, you can you can get it. Uh, I think that's nice for people who want a news mount. It's like got a bunch of bones in it. Yeah, that's that's great. Uh- so one quick warning, by the way, we discovered last night, and I don't know if people were aware of this because I sure wasn't. Progression on faded raid bosses, the achievements towards the jelly cat are not shared across your accounts. Like the meta is like if you have one character that did one raid, one character that did the other raid, and then another character that did the third raid, you can still get it. But if you switch characters mid raid, like, I don't know, say you're trying to kill Sylvanas on a hunter for the legendary bow that they said was going to have an increased drop rate and it didn't happen. Um, so you don't get the achievement for that faded raid. It doesn't count. So like you have to complete it as a single character. Just throwing that out there in case you didn't know, because I didn't. I'm not that surprised because it's a quest. I mean, it's not an achievement. It's a quest. And quests have always been single characters and an individual quest. Of course, I'm like the last person who would have a problem with this. So <laughs> because I mainly play a single character, which makes it pretty straightforward. Yeah, I got nothing. Just something to throw out there. Although I am excited mm-hmm. to get into Sepulchre uh, of the first ones uh, tomorrow when our guild does uh, it. So yeah, yeah. Could be entertaining. Uh I don't know if I'm looking forward to fighting Anduin again, but... It's, uh, it's normal. We'll be fine. It'll be fine. Oh, yeah, you're right. You're right. Normal, probably no big deal. Normal I'm sure fate, he's a total pushover. So we... Yeah, but... Normal fate, it is different. Not it's that harder. much, it, though. The mechanics aren't that much... They don't... I'm trying to think out a phrase this thought. I'm not going to want to downplay it. It's not that bad. It's perfectly manageable. And I'll, I'll shut up and let Liz talk, because I think she has opinions on that. I mean, I would say it's surprising how easy it is. Faded does not feel like a difficulty bump. Like, not at all. Uh, Normal, if you've been doing heroics, normal is a breeze. The only problem we've had in normal is, you know, the fact that some of these fights we haven't done in a really long time. So we forget mechanics. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. And I mean, even heroic, I think the reason we... We haven't been doing a ton of heroic faded, but I feel like the reason we haven't been is just because it like we're at the level and the skill level and the item level where heroic is a little bit of a challenge. And I kind of think that after this whole expansion, we're at the end of the expansion and we don't want to try super hard. (laughs) So we do a few bosses in heroic and we're like, okay, we're done. We're done. But now, it, it does not feel hard. This is not like going from heroic rating to mythic rating or anything like that. So for context, if you haven't done a faded raid yet, there are four essential mechanics that get added to various bosses, right? There is creation spark, which is you dispel it from uh, your raid members and things that uh, appear on the ground, circles that have to be soaked show up and somebody has to soak them. If you don't, it's a lot of damage, goes everywhere. Everybody's sad, so make sure you catch the balls. Uh, Reconfiguration emitter is something that will continually cast, uh, so you need to interrupt it. 
uh, to keep it from doing, again, raid-wide damage and potentially wiping your raid. Don't forget it exists on bosses like, you know, the Huntsman. That's a thing. Uh, Protoform Barrier, which puts a barrier around the boss, and you cannot uh, damage the boss until the barrier is taken care of. And there are two sides of that. There's the one that you can heal, and then another ball that you can destroy, whichever one gets there first, determine and how quickly determines the level of the buff. And then there's the chaotic essence, which summons a whole bunch of little ads uh, that you the more you kill, the better your buff is. Um, so it's it's not that hard on like normal. When you start getting into like heroic, where there's other things to watch, I can see some of this getting out of hand. But honestly, the mechanics the, right now, at least to me, don't feel too bad. Honestly, I, I barely know what any of the faded stuff does. It's just, uh, oh, there's a puddle to soak. Okay. It's it, like, it seems so, like such a minor change that it doesn't affect play style at all. It's just, okay, there's another puddle to soak. Okay. There are ads. I should probably kill them. You know, but I, I, it just doesn't feel like much. It doesn't feel like much, but I do appreciate it. And, and mm -hmm. it, because like a lot of these fights, um, We've talked about this before on the show where like you go into a fight and sometimes you feel like you're on autopilot. You've done it so yeah. many times, you know, everything inside and out. You don't even think about it. Um, it this is nice because it's, just, it's a little extra something. Um, and I don't know if they plan to do more with it later on or change it up. There are those wonderful consoles that sit in the front of the faded raids that I think are I don't know what I forgot what they're for. I think they're for activating uh, the faded version when everything becomes unlocked. But it's just kind of, it's kind of neat. It's a nice little flavor touch. All right. Uh, Going to basically drop it over to WoW to WoW Classic for a second because we've got the date for the Wrath Classic pre-patch is going to drop on August 30th. The actual expansion will be coming to WoW Classic on September 26th. We already knew that, but the August 30th pre-patch is new. So that means it'll be about a little less than a month in the pre-patch before you you head up to Northrend. Um, I remember the actual going from Burning Crusade to Wrath experience, because that's when Titan's Grip first came into the game. <laughs> and that's when I went from, you know, oh, my off-spec is ARMS, to my off-spec is always Fury forever and ever now. Um, and, and if I can make it my main spec, I will, but you guys are going to make me tank eventually anyway, so I just uh, I accept that that's going to happen, but I'm going to be Fury if I'm not. Um, so yeah, uh, that's happening. Um, they, I think, I believe the, uh, the buff, which is not called winds of wisdom, but it's exactly the same as winds of wisdom. Joyous uh, journeys. Joyous I think. journeys. I believe that's going straight up till the actual expansion drop, if I'm not mistaken. So if you are trying to level your way through, uh, burning crusade classic right now to get ready for wrath classic, you've got a little bit more, a little bit less than a month from, from the 30th. It's not the 30th yet. It's the 16th. So you've actually got a little bit more than a month right now, but you will, you won't get the new talent and stuff until August 30th. Uh, I don't think either of us, and I don't think anybody here plays a lot of WoW Classic. I just um, dip my toes in right. occasionally. That's about it. Joe? No, I'm good. Thanks, I'm full. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, well, I, I do. I, I, I've gone in for screenshots, and I think that's really about it. Yeah, I, I play it occasionally just to look at the original models. Uh, but yeah, that's so that's happening. Um, I think at this point, I'm going to bring up the. Diablo 3 Season 27 start, because we found out today it's starting on August 26th. Uh, we already knew when Season 26 was ending, so we had a good idea that it was either going to be at the 26th or it was going to be the week after, uh, so early September. I'm personally glad that it's going to be the 26th. I like it better when they have a small five-day gap between the end of one season and the start of another. Um, that's personally my favorite, but... The season itself is going to be the one with the angelic crucibles. I don't remember what they're calling it, um, like season of heavenly power or something, but basically the angelic crucible is an item that will be dropping. When you hit level 70, uh, it will drop from pretty much anything, but it's got a, it's got a doubled drop rate from when they originally implemented it on the, on the uh, PTR, but still not like, this is not something that's going to be dropping every five seconds. But once you get the angelic crucible, you can use it to uh, turn any legendary that is not crafted any level 70 non-crafted legendary, so equipable legendaries at level 70, you can turn them into sanctified items. A sanctified item behaves like an ancient legendary. It's got the stat spread like an ancient legendary. It's got the, the original item's legendary power, and it will have a new power. One of three are possible for every class. Uh, one of the examples 
that I personally love is the one that, that necromancers get where their golem starts picking up corpses and carries them with it up to 30 corpses. And it will, when you use an ability that spends corpses, it'll, it'll just toss corpses from the pile on its back out. So you can use them. I mean, that's really handy. That's That's that's, so handy. That's handy. It's gross. It's gross in the best way. It's perfect for the necromancer. It's like, that's just, that's just so that's sweet. Um, It it makes you wonder why haven't we asked our golem to do this the whole time? Why did we have to touch the power of heaven to convince the golem to carry corpses around for us? (laughs) Because it is truly a divine task. Yeah. (laughs) But it's like the one, the one of the ones I liked when I was writing up the thing was, uh, they they haven't there's there's a sanctified power that basically makes magic missile cast 20 missiles and you get the uh the homing ability just straight up like it, the, the the missiles are homing they, they they will go unerringly to their target and it's like that means you can get up to two uh you know two glyphs on your on your magic missile and it's casting 20 missiles like this is simple. It's a simple power. It's not super complicated. A lot of the powers are somewhat complicated. This one's ridiculously simple and it's beautiful. It's just amazing. It's like, yes, I don't even like playing wizard in Diablo. I've not done it yet. And yet I'm thinking, wow, I may have to do that just to see that, just to <laughs> see that go off. Like, Oh, oh wow. Um, there's a nice one for, for crusaders where they, uh, they, every couple of seconds, they just, they, they, like they cast the, like one of their abilities. I think it's the, the, like the big sword that drops on people like rain from heaven or something. They just drop it every couple of seconds on random tr- trash mobs. It's great. There's a lot of really cool abilities. There's some that feel a little fiddly. Um, one of the warrior ones is really not warrior. Sorry. My God. <laughs> barbarian. One of the barbarian ones is pretty, it, it's, you have to like stack an ability. Every time you hit somebody, it stacks the ability. And if it, you know, when you get to 50, it can use the, it, the stack can go off when you hit uh, wrath of the righteous and that will increase your damage by like 0.5% per stack. And so if you have up to 50, which is the maximum you can spend on this ability, um, you know, 50 times 0.5 is 25%. So you'll get a flat 25% damage buff with everything you do for like 12 seconds when you hit wrath of the righteous. There are builds for which that would be ridiculously powerful if the stack is easy enough to maintain. And that's something, you know, without knowing how easy it is to maintain the stack, I can't tell you how good that power is going to be. But since you can only use one Sanctified Legendary at a time, but you can have up to three of them. I mean, not up to three of them. You can have, like, you can have Sanctified Legendaries, like, in your entire, your inventory can be full of them. You can have dozens of them, but you can only equip one at a time. So it's kind of like getting an extra Kanai's Cube slot in a way. It's like, you'll have this, this one of these three abilities, you'll have it. Um, it's interesting. Uh, it, it's certainly not. I don't feel like it's going to be as unbalancing as other seasons have been. Like the uh, season 25, uh, the, 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 you know, Lords of Hell abilities that came from the, the gems that you could slot that were actually like pieces of their various soul stones. Those, there was a lot of interaction between those and a lot of like, you could level them up and do this and that with them. This is much simpler. I don't know if it's going to end up feeling as, as consequential as a result of that. It might just feel like this weird thing you do, but considering that they're, they're, they're bringing the, uh, the, the wailing nightmare. Is that called the wailing nightmare? What is that thing called? Oh my God. I do them all the time. Well, the, the thing that they introduced in season 26 is coming forward into season echoing, echoing, echoing nightmare. nightmare. Yes. Yeah. It's petrified scream is the actual piece that drops. Um, um, that's the new kind of rift, right? Yeah, that's the, the yeah. it's like, a, it's a basically just a keep going as more and more stuff tries to kill you. And eventually either they'll overwhelm you or you'll, or you'll die, but you get up to a certain level and it, it gives you a gem that you can use to upgrade gear at a certain level. It's actually really cool. Um, I've done them and I like them, but that's I coming think, forward. Yeah. Uh, I think this is only the second time that Diablo has added a seasonal thing that has gone into the base game. Yeah. I, I, if okay, what's the first one? Um, the, the follower equipment that was oh, added right, in yeah. co- when a season came yeah, out. Technically yeah. that was seasonal. Yeah. It, 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 yeah. But this is the first time they've come up with a new game mode and had it continue forward. Yeah. Which is pretty So that's, cool. that's really interesting. Yeah. And, and it is a fun game mode. If you haven't done it, um, you've got a couple weeks, uh, jump on Diablo three and give it a shot. It is actually a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, that's so that's pretty much that for for Diablo three. I don't think there's much else to say about that. 
Uh, Liz has got the calendar here. I think we've covered the, we didn't cover the Overwatch anniversary remix. That's this, that's right now and through the 30th. Yeah. 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 Um, I mean, just log on, collect your skins. Yeah. Et cetera, et cetera. We covered well, the WoW patch thing because we, we talked about the, uh, the mobile auction house. We, we covered uh, D3 season 26. Let's talk about Gamescom. Uh, since we don't know what's going to be coming out at Gamescom, we don't, we know there's no, uh, there's no Blizz- BlizzCon this year. Uh, and we already know what the next WoW expansion is. Uh, I'm pretty sure we know that since, you know, we've been playing it. So, and we're going to talk about that. We are going to talk about the, 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 uh, about Dragonflight. Don't worry. But, um, Gamescom's coming out and there's going to be the WoW variety show. And I have no idea what that's going to be. Do okay. either of you understand those, this thing? Those are separate things. Just to yeah. be no, clear. But I'm talking, they're in the, yeah. they're in the same um, family. Yeah, I mean, they're both happening next week. That's basically it. It's like some kind of competition thing where it's uh, it's it's hosted by Talison and Evatel. So I think it's going to it's potentially going to be fun to watch. But uh, it's the first time they've done it. I don't know what's going to happen, but maybe it'll be interesting. We will find out. But yeah, um, Joe, do you have anything to say about either of those things before we move on? I do not. Okay, Dragonflight. Uh, <laughs> it's not live right now because you can tell because I'm streaming this and I'm in the regular game. But I, I believe we're going to get a new patch. We don't know. Like, we, I don't think we're talking about what it is yet. We are getting a new patch, and uh, Blizzard has told us it's not going to be today. It'll probably be out tomorrow, which should be Wednesday. Uh, depending on when you listen to this, it may already be live. We just don't really know anything about what's going to happen. Yeah. Mm. But. From last week, uh, we got the new zone to explore, uh, which is a cool zone, by the way, and I can never remember the name because it is one of those names. Ash- the, yeah. Ashaman? Asha oh. something? Yeah. Mm. But uh, it's a level 65 zone, so you got to look at some some of your further in talents and so forth. Having been playing on and off like for like an hour or two at a time, I actually kind of feel like the, the talents are starting to get somewhere where they're at least... I can see the end of the tunnel on them. Uh, I don't mm-hmm. know that this means that they will be that I feel like they will be ready and fully realized and perfect. They're never going to be perfect. That just that just doesn't happen. But I don't know if I feel like that like it'll be ready by the end of the year. But I feel like I can see where it's trying to go. The most recent patch that dropped Holy Paladins and mm-hmm. I think War in general are in now, right? Yes, uh, it, we're only missing monks and demon hunters at this point. Okay. Mm-hmm. But uh, I felt like, at least in terms of the Warriors, which is the class I've been playing, because... It's Matt. It's me. Yeah. I, mean, <laughs> um, I do have the one Evoker that I heal on, and I do have the one Shaman that I look pretty on. Um, but otherwise, in terms of, like, the Warriors, I've been I've been look, running around looking at the talents, thinking about it. I feel like they, they made some really good baseline improvements, like, in terms of, like, streamlining the trees and making them flow better and make more sense. Uh, like, for instance, the Titan's Grip single-minded fury decision is a node now. And it's right in the middle, so it's it doesn't you don't you're not forced to go skew out one way or the other and try and pick both up. Uh, you get one of them. You you make a decision. You get one of them, and then you can still pick all the different talents and you can use them in single minded fury mode or titan's grip mode, which I liked. I think in general the the talent trees are coming together. Uh, I think certain classes feel more. I want to say realized. Like, I, I don't know. Liz, you have you had a chance to play with Holy Pally? I did a little Holy Pally last week, and then I didn't get a chance to go back. Uh, yes, I've played around with it. I really, like, you know, we have a bunch of people in the alpha, and we really need to get together and run some dungeons and really get a feel for this. Um, I'm not unhappy with how Paladins are turning out and how Holy Paladins are turning out. I think the tree, both the spec tree and the class tree, have some weird choices and weird pathing, which, you know, by the time they put out the next patch, they may have done, you know, another version on those. They have been uh, iterating on a lot of class trees. So I'm interested to see what they do and what they take from the feedback they've gotten in the past week. Um, But I mean, I know there are, there are multiple interesting builds I can put together from this. Uh, The weird thing is like the class tree for paladins is kind of like broken up into like, there's a path for holy, there's kind of a general path in the middle, and there's a path for ret down on the right side of the tree. And the the last like third of the holy side just is not interesting at all. So, I mean, the build I've been looking at has been 
you know, building out the center tree and the ret tree, <laughs> the ret side of that tree, and picking up a lot of, uh, well, at least some dps -y things. One of the interesting things they've done for paladins in general is they seem to be going with a much heavier focus on consecration. Uh, currently, I'm not a really super heavily experienced retribution paladin, but I have talked to some to get advice on how to play a retribution paladin. And uh, basically, they've told me to take consecration off my bars because casting it at any time is a DPS loss. Um, so they've got a bunch of things in the trees that improve consecration. In the core tree, there's a talent that improves its damage and a talent that makes it heal. So I wonder if it's going to be like just kind of a, a mini Ashen Hollow. Ashen Hollow is the um, Vinthyr talent, Vinthyr class ability right now. And it does this big puddle that does damage and heals. And it seems like they're going to make Consecration like a tiny bit like that. It's going to be, it's doing more damage and it's doing a little healing. And any paladin can pick that up, which I think is kind of interesting. But like the build I'm looking at right now seems to go heavily into damage talents instead of the healing side of the core class tree. And, um, you know, I can pick up Divine Toll. I can pick up, uh, I can basically get the whole kind of Shockadin sort of thing, the the Holy Shock uh, thing with okay, Divine Toll. Okay, if Shockadin actually comes back and is viable, uh, I will I be so, so amused like, by this. I, I mean, I don't think so. I don't think so. But like right now, healing it with Holy Paladins, you kind of have this uh, sort of shock barrier thing where you're doing, you're trying to get out Holy Shocks as fast as possible. Or you have the Light of the Martyr thing where you're using Light of the Martyr with Mrad's Dying Breath to do big spot heals at the cost of your own health. Um, and you kind of have both of those things on different sides of the Holy Tree. So you can kind of choose, okay, I'm going to path down this way, or I'm going to path down that way. They're really separated out. Um, there are some really weird choices in there, though. But I think I can make like some really interesting builds, and I can get combinations of talents that are like impossible to get right now. So, I mean, I think there, there are some builds that I'm very interested in playing around with. There's also... Um, They've taken the Night Fae Holy ability and put it in the Paladin class tree, which I find very strange. There are no Night Fae Holy Paladins. There are just Night Fae and the Paladins do not go together right now. And they've put the ability in the Holy class tree, which is both weird and like interesting because it's it's a buff that um like it's like a 40% chance to cause damage dealing abilities to do extra damage. It lasts for 30 seconds and the skill is on a 45 second cooldown. And uh, someone in my guild was doing the math and they're like, yeah, that, that gets out to like an 8% DPS increase. So it actually sounds kind of insane. Just having a single buff that if you keep casting it is that big of a DPS increase. I'm assuming this is going to get nerfed because it's not it's not nearly that powerful on live because it uh, it's a buff that like cycles through like it's bl blessing of summer then blessing of autumn then blessing of winter then blessing of spring and it each time you cast it it cycles but currently on the alpha it's blessing of summer which is the most powerful one and it's just blessing of summer it doesn't cycle so that would make it very reliable, whereas on live in Shadowlands, it cycles through buffs that are of varying values. And to get back to this Blessing of Summer, which is the big DPS increase, you would have to cast it, you know, four times. So I'm just curious to see where this is headed. Cool. Uh, Joe, you got anything to say about Shaman? Uh, it's getting better. Uh, like you, I can start to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, I can see, like, and I've never, I was trepidatious about the, the whole thing from the beginning. And I'm still kind of being cautious about how much optimism I put into it because I haven't been able to really put it through its paces yet. 
I finally feel like they switch things around and move things, which is one of the major things that I was asking for. And not just myself, like a lot of like the shaman in general, were asking for talents to be moved around and for clear paths to sort of start to be carved out. Um, so there's definitely, they're definitely listening. They're definitely doing that, but I want to see how effective it is. And that's, that's the part that's tricky because I can get, just about what I think I would want for like my, my general healing build. So I have two me. This is just a me personal thing. Like in live, I have two kind of mindsets. One where I want to beat everybody else and sort of like just I want to be the superhero healer of the moment. It's rare that I get there. Um, that or where that I want to do that. Usually it's when and I'm looking at you, Rosa. I know you listen. I'm looking at you. Um, when, when I want to beat Rosa. But otherwise, I try to fill this gap where it's like just kind of keep everybody alive and kind of maintain a middle ground, which I did. I've done for most of Sepulchre. Um, so I feel like I can kind of get to that point again. And that's the part that feels untested because I can pick up things like Earth Living. I can pick up things like Extra Totems, which is bugged, by the way. Um, and I think they're probably fixing that, hopefully, in this patch. Um, but I can start to see. I can start to see glimmers of hope, but I'm also kind of where you are. I don't know that it will be. Well, let me strike that. I guarantee it won't be 100% by the time it releases. And part of that is just going to be a factor of there's only so much time. And we've seen this before where it'll be good enough and then they can continue to make changes to make it better. And I'm kind of okay with that with the talents at this point, because it's not really going to be a that big of a thing up front. So. Hopeful. I mean, I also, I also think it's never going to be, you know, 100, 100 percent. It's it never, never going is. to be. No, never. Yeah. Yeah. And that's just, you know, if you've been playing the game for more than one expansion, you you will definitely get used to that cycle of, OK, we fixed this issue, but inadvertently <laughs> we, we seem to have opened this issue. Um, uh, so. Kind of like how today they added the mobile auction house and the commodities market, and now the auction house does not function at all. Yep. And, they, <laughs> and it was tested, but you know, stuff doesn't always come up until you. Uh, put stuff it live. happens. Stuff happens. But I think at this point, um, we should try and move on and at least do a couple of questions. Uh, well, let's see if there's anything I, else we need, absolutely need to cover here. Like we did the Overwatch thing. I there uh, so is class changes. I was there, reading it. There, okay. Uh, do you do you want to read it? Like actually, like read it to the folks. So because you wrote this part of the email. Uh, I mean, WoW Classic is getting race and class changes, and that is it's something that was, I believe, originally in Wrath of the Lich King Classic that came out towards the end of Wrath. Yeah, it yes. was near. It was right around the time that they released uh, the new the the, the LFD system. They, yeah, they also and. These changes. But the classic team was not going to add race and class changes to. Wrath Classic. They just, they were, they've been, you know, we've gone from no changes to some changes. And um, they're really working hard to preserve the feeling of Classic, not so much the reality of Classic, but that feeling of a close knit community where you're really talking and having a lot of a more social experience. And they originally felt like being able to switch to the flavor of the month, race, faction, whatever, would take away from that. But um, they listened to player feedback and read what everyone said and decided to, okay, we are going to add race and faction changes to the game because in the end, it helps you play with your friends. You can say, okay, I'm going Horde, I'm going Alliance because my friends are there. So that... I. I feel really good that they are listening when players speak up and say, Hey, we don't like this. We want, we want something different. I will say um, this though, guys, hmm. if you're playing wrath, classic resist the resist, what your, your progression minded guild is going to try and get you to do. Don't let them make you switch to night elf to tank an Uber <laughs> They will, they will push you to do this because the heroic mode in Uber the 25 to 25 hard one, the ability that night elves have that gives you just an, a flat extra 1% dodge is worth its weight in gold for a tank. And since y y paladins can't be night elves, the only ones, the only tanks at the time who could were death knights, druids, and warriors. Don't let them make you do it because they will never stop riding your butt about it. And it will annoy you. 
and you'll be taking screenshots for Blizzard Watch. Oh, wait, you won't be doing that. Okay, <laughs> the rest of it, though, yeah, just be careful. I hated that. That was one of the things I hated about about uh, Wrath of the Lich King was the constant pressure to change to the, the flavor of the month for tanking. It was really annoying. Hmm. And I gave in once, and I felt really bad afterwards. But, yeah, I guess then that would be it for the various news stories. I mean, there's you, there's always more, but... You, you did skip over one big one. <laughs> Which one? Which is Hearthstone. Oh, which right. I sent in my you first said email. Your second email. Like, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I I kept thinking of things that should be in the list, and I kept emailing. Um, a huge Hearthstone patch went out today, which uh, we knew it was coming. They rolled out uh, Murder at Castle Nathria a few weeks ago, and the meta has kind of settled into a place where. Demon hunters and warriors were winning like 34, 35% of their games. And it was it was real bad to have like two classes that were kind of unplayable because you would just get beat down every time, just a huge percentage of times. Like they kind of try to keep everyone in the 50% range. You know, they want to, you can have a better deck or you can be a better player and run the deck better and you'll you have a better chance of winning. But uh, yeah, this was real low. And they made a bunch of significant uh, buffs to both of these classes. Kind of, um, I don't know, I would call them small adjustments. Like there are a bunch of little tweaks. Like, okay, this costs one mana less, and this has one more health, or this has one more attack. And just, but there are a lot of them for uh, demon hunters and warriors and uh, paladins who were only just edging above demon hunters and warriors. So it'll be really interesting to see how that plays out. Uh, see if those kind of less desirable classes actually kind of get up to being playable because it's been it's been a weird meta so far. Uh, also, some Battlegrounds changes. If you're into Battlegrounds, jump into Battlegrounds. Greasebot is back, which I know everyone was probably excited about. And uh, they've kind of nerfed the Ysera build. And they've made some tweaks to some heroes. I'm interested in seeing how uh, Elise plays because they've totally reworked her hero power to be... <sighs> she had this thing where you could get a recruitment map and recruit a minion. But now it's just you pay one gold and you recruit a minion from your current tavern tier. But... Each time you do it, it increases in costs. So you kind of want to get pretty high up before you start using it and get minions you really want. But uh, we'll kind of see how it plays out. I'm, I am very interested in how the meta shifts after all of these card changes because there are a lot of changes. I, I don't know anything about what you just said. So I'm <laughs> okay, things happened. Well, um, uh, yeah, things happened. That does kind of sum it up. A lot of things changed. If you play Hearthstone, log into Hearthstone. Check it out. That's all I got. All right. Uh, we are going to try and do at least a couple questions. We've got a little time. I guess we, we might actually have a little bit more time than I think we do because we had a six-minute delay. But regardless, we're going to try and do a couple. Um, if you've got a question for the podcast, uh, please send an email to podcast at blizzardwatch.com with the subject line podcast of Blizzard Watch. Um, or you can go to our Discord server. Um, you can go to the patron Q and podcast questions channel if you're a patron. And we we tend to go there first because you guys pay the bills and keep us able to do the show at all. Um, so we like to say thank you. And uh, But if you can't afford to be a patron or just, you know, things aren't working out that way, that's fine. We, we do still appreciate anybody who comes to the site and feels like engaging with us. So there's a Q and podcast questions channel for non-patrons, and you can ask your questions there as well. Um I usually come up with some random thing, but this time I'm just going to say, hey, Joe, can you read something? Sure. Uh, let's go with this question from Tetsemi. Question for Transmog Watch. Uh, plate wearing female night elf warrior. I too want to bring the gun show like Taronda does in the ending cinematics for Sh from Shadowlands. Like Jane and the Valkyries do in Thor, Love and Thunder. What plate options are there? Is it just hiding the shoulders and finding a decent chest piece? Or how would you bring the, the Night Elf gun show? I am not a plate wearer. And I want to hear <laughs> what Liz and Matt, who pretty much exclusively play plate wearers, have to say about this. I mean, Liz go first. There, there are backless chest plate pieces. Uh, I mean, yeah, I think you have to find the right chest piece. 
Uh, sometimes you'll want to not have shoulders if you have shoulders that kind of go down your arms and some of them do, but it's really going to be finding the right chest piece that does not cover your upper back. And uh, a lot of those go heavy into the plate bikini territory, so it may be hard to find the right one. But there, there are some interesting models out there. I don't know armor names off the top of my head, but there are options there. There are lots of really weird skimpy plate options out there, and some of them will definitely suit. Okay, uh, if you are watching the stream, I just jumped on my mount. And I put together on the Night Elf, Night Elf Warrior that I'm currently playing on this, this very podcast. If you're looking at it here, this is the Tier 10 Warrior set. You'll notice that I turned one shoulder off. Remember that we can do that now. You can turn off one shoulder. You don't have to turn off both shoulders. You can just turn off one. I always turn off um, the left one just because that's what I do. It's, it's, you know, there's no rhyme or reason to it. You'll notice, though that you can't really do the gun show on a female night elf or for that matter, a female blood elf or void elf or nightborn because we all have stick arms. I mean, you can look at them right here. They're not big arms, but if you wanted to do that kind of thing, I would recommend uh, male Trani, female Kul'Tiran, and female over male. The females have much bigger arms in relation to their bodies. They look much, much punchier. Um, any Tauren, any Tauren, male or female, doesn't matter. Any Tauren. Uh, orc, orc ladies, yeah, I mean, orc, orc dudes got guns, we, but everybody knows orc dudes got guns. Everybody knows that ma human males got guns. But orc ladies, yeah, really, really nice, solid build for if you want to look like a barbarian type. Those are the ones I'd go for. I'm hoping that Night Elves will get Taronda arms. I really want them to get Taronda arms and Taronda backs. Because, man, the new Toronto model looks like she's going to punch people all day. Um, quite frankly, the, the cinematic with her and Sylvanas at the very end of Shadowlands is still one of my favorite cinematics. Where she's like, oh, you know, yeah, oh, you're going to suffer until everybody you hurt isn't going to suffer. Really nice performance. Uh, the, the fact that you can say that about an animated video game character, that it was a nice performance. I, I mean, the vocals were nice, but... They did a lot of kinesthetics with the model that was really good too. But yeah, you can see right here. This, unfortunately, I'm kind of on the fence about this model because I don't like the belly shirt thing. Never been a huge fan of it. But it does do a good job of giving you that feeling of revealing something. So, And technically, the belt I have on with the set does not match it. It's actually from Cataclysm. But there is no belt for this set. So yeah. I had to just come up with something. So there you go. That's that's going to be the hardest part about giving yourself kind of a gun show is you're going to be wearing something skimpy that shows off maybe more skin than is practical if you're planning on getting into a brawl and punching a lot of people. See, I don't mind that because like the whole barbarian thing, but mm -hmm. I, I do wish that it felt even between you know, male and female characters. Yeah. And that's the problem. Like if a male wears this breastplate, they get the full breastplate. But if a, if a woman wears it, there's a belly shirt. Why would you make a plate belly shirt? <laughs> the whole point of plate armor. If you're going to wear a plate breastplate, you want it to cover the part with all the guts in it. You know, that's, that's, you don't want those getting stabbed. I mean, you don't want the heart or lungs getting stabbed either. So it does make sense. You'd cover those, but you should just keep covering stuff till you get all the way down to the belt <laughs> and then keep covering down past that. That's the point of armor. Armor should cover things. So that's that, that, but that's like, a, this is a solid enough set for that kind of, stripped down thing in general yeah if you're doing a plate set you are there's relatively few shoulder pieces that won't just kind of interfere because look at how look at the size of the shoulders on this thing like if you're not watching the stream you'll just have to listen to me describe it but i'm wearing a shoulder that is basically the head of a pig <laughs> and it, it takes up it goes right down to almost halfway down the bicep it is enormous uh so yeah in general i think it is, it, is, it is sometimes difficult to find sets that, that give that sense of power. And I definitely think it's easier for some group races than others, which is why I think that there should be body sliders and different levels of thickness. And, and you know, you could go for a more muscle look or you could go for a just chonky look. I, I would love to have all my characters be somewhat pudgy, um, be partially because I am somewhat pudgy. And secondly, if you've ever actually looked at like the world's strongest man competitions, those dudes are all kind of chunky. It, it's just, it is something that happens. Uh, so yeah, 
but I, I that's pretty much all I have to say on it. Uh, Joe, you got anything you said you just wanted to hear? Yeah, because I mean, I my plate transmog is generally, uh, and I can already feel the eyes from the ethereal plane upon me. Uh, my paladin lives in judgment. <laughs> so, <laughs> so. Yeah, he does live in judgment if he lives in judgment. I think he's being judged quite frequently, yes. <laughs> So does yeah. he use Ashkandi? Yes, actually. Oh, of course he does. Yeah, Gee, dude, what? I'm surprised you you get to sleep at night. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's either Ashkandi or uh, um, what? You, why words are hard? Ashbringer, one or the other. So yeah, that's all I got. I got I got nothing on pl- in the whole plate side. <laughs> I will say there's a really nice. There's actually a really nice uh, um, transmog you can do using a paladin set. Uh, it's, it's mostly pieces from, um, Dragon Soul. It's the Paladin set from Dragon Soul. I think it's the heroic version because it's a very silvery color. Uh, you can wear the hat or not wear the hat. Uh, but even with the shoulder pieces, like the shoulder pieces are not actually, they don't have a lookalike for warriors. So your night elf won't get them. And oddly enough, that helps. Uh, it's just the, the, the breastplate, which does kind of a belly shirt thing but it actually comes down in a way where it, it feels like it's attaching and with night elf skin tones it almost kind of looks like you're just wearing a piece of armor but the whole thing feels very like it feels like it's a a carapace on you and it does it does feel really good for that kind of look if you're going for that kind of you know i have exposed skin for you know to show off my manly my you know muscly arms that's that's a good one for that uh i can't remember the name of the set liz do you remember the name of the set from from cataclysm the uh dragon soul paladin set i i do not i'm afraid yeah i, I couldn't re- i can't remember it but yeah um, okay you want to read the next one before we go uh i can do that from yurik hey rossi Here's one for the Blizzard Watch podcast. Listening to Lore Watch this week and the question of Magic the Gathering brought unhappy memories flooding back to remind me why I don't play it. My question is, are there certain games or IPs that trigger memories in you guys that are so really good, it's the reason why you still play, are so really bad that you may never go back to it or will be waiting a very long time before picking it back up? This is a tough one. Yeah, I mean, there are quite a few games that I have that kind of feeling about. Um, I mean, WoW is one of those games that has enough good memories that I'm still playing it. Like, I mean, I've, I've got a, a million weird little stories about WoW, so that certainly could answer that question. But in terms of non-WoW games, I mean, yeah, um, yeah, there's, there's, this is a hard question. Uh, Joe, I, you got anything? I do, actually. I have a couple of answers. Uh, so... One of the ones, and I've talked about this on Tavern Watch, that I have a fondness for is Call of Cthulhu. Uh, not because I'm super into like Lovecraftian lore or anything like that, um, but because I had really positive play experiences when I got to play it as a teenager. Uh, the One of the main writers happened to be going to college at a local university here, uh, working on his uh, master's degree or his doctorate. I forgot which. I forgot if he actually, what his, his, his end goal was, but uh, he wrote for Chaosium. He wrote the books. He actually did a whole bunch of like anthropological research for, for college and then turned that into content for these games. And so when he ran the games, uh, he was always enthusiastic about what was happening in it. And it wasn't just body horror for the sake of horror or just bad stuff happens because you know it's supposed to it's a cthulhu-esque story uh and it left a really positive impression in 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 my mind because because it was just much different than what you would expect i think uh for that particular type of game and you know dan harms if you happen to be listening to this shout out to you you were you ran great games uh the one that i would say left a bad taste in my mouth was most of the world of darkness games not because they were particularly bad, but when I was playing them or trying to play them in the 90s, there was a particular group of people in my area that sort of flocked to that game. And it was not a positive play experience. There was a lot of, of homophobia. There was a lot of uh, casual racism in that particular group. And I after a couple times of like, okay, maybe it was a one-off or maybe, maybe it was different. Maybe they didn't mean it like that. I just never went back. And it's not that I blame the games for that. I don't, 
but it definitely lasts an impression on me and it definitely was bad enough that there's sort of like a, a little bit of an association there. So those are, those are mine good and bad. So I've been trying to come up with something for a while now. And there's like, oddly enough for me, I would actually, like, I actually only had good experiences with the world of darkness, which I don't think is common. Actually. Um, I've heard a lot of people have had bad experiences. Uh, but I think in terms of games that really just kind of got me back into playing role-playing games again, when I was, I was falling out of it. Uh, I would say like in 1997 and 1999, it was just, my life was not in a place where I could play. I didn't know anybody who played. Um, and then I, I stumbled upon a group of people in the uh, in Maryland, in the College Park, Maryland area, uh, where the University of Maryland is. Uh, a friend of mine was going there. And I ended up in their, their GURPS game. Yes, GURPS, the generic <laughs> universal role-playing system. That game got me back into role-playing. Uh, and it wasn't because of the game. It was because of the, the people, you know? But it was still, it's still the case that that's what got me back in. That's what got me interested in playing again. And I just, you know, to this day, it really has, it's really been, it was one of the best experiences I had in a group. The game system itself, I mean, it wasn't terrible. It wasn't awesome. It wasn't the best system. It wasn't the worst system. Um, it was the blurst system. Uh, but nevertheless, I, I, I have really positive memories of, of GURPS and uh, especially GURPS Supers because it was kind of a GURPS Supers slash spy campaign. It was an interesting game. Yeah. So my, hey, Mark, uh, yeah, I'm giving, now I'm doing a shout out. Uh, but yeah, I, I would say that that GURPS is one of those ones that I, I, even though I don't play it anymore, I still have all the books. <laughs> um, I haven't bought any new ones. I don't even know if they're still, if they are even doing new ones. They are. Uh, new, there's yeah. a new set. There's a new set coming out, I think, in, uh, next year, supposedly. Yeah. I have not been keeping up, but I do have all the old books. Uh, I still, you know, go through them every so often. They're really well-researched, well-written books. So yeah, I would say GURPS. GURPS is a really positive one. There's a few others, but that's the one I'll go with on that. I can't think of any tabletop games that have done that, but I'll tell you a computer game that, that made me not want to play it to the point where I, I refuse to nowadays. Um, I'm trying to think of how to put this. There was a, have you ever played Ultima nine? Mm. It's been a long time since I played the Ultima games. Yeah. Ultima nine kind of like ruined me. Like I wasn't, I wasn't a big Ultima head in the first place. I hadn't played that many of them, but Ultima nine is so bad that even not knowing half of how it was bad, I just could feel how bad it was. And I just did not want to be playing it. And I've never gone back to it. And it's made me not play other Ultima games. Hmm. Like I've not gone back to any of the Ultima games just because nine was that bad. Eight wasn't very good either. Pagan, Ultima eight Pagan, it's, I did not like. It's been so long since I played anything Ultima. So everything has flown right out of my head. Yeah, but those games, I remember just not enjoying them. Yeah, and I think I think we all have games like that. I think everybody does, whether good or bad. And and there's always some formative experience that I think colors your perception, even as you you get older and move on. So, yeah, I'm I'm willing to admit that it could very well be that you know Ultima Nine is not as bad as I remember it. But I just remember there was like one fight with like a crab where it was just a crab. <laughs> it was just a crab, and like literally my character was just hitting it and hitting it and hitting it with a sword for like seven minutes. An uninterrupted seven minute stretch of time where I was just swinging my sword into a crab over and over. And, and I'm like, no. And did you say no. that the experience left you crabby? I would say that I couldn't <laughs> get it to flip. I couldn't flip it over to hit it for massive damage. I just couldn't. It would not flip over for the massive damage. It just wouldn't. No amount, no amount of Steve Ballmer saying it would. Did, no, just wouldn't do it. So yeah, no, that crab. <sighs> that crab is like my, my Ernest Hemingway old man in the sea story. <laughs> except, you know. <laughs> With crabs. <laughs> uh, I don't know how to react to that one. Uh, I mean, I just, I just have nothing. I think any games that have made me feel this way, I've just like pushed out of my mind completely. I've let them fade to time. Yeah, I just, I, it took me a while to remember that, but when I remembered it, it was like it came rushing back. But I think in terms of like you know games that are good that give you good memories, a lot of times it's nothing to do with the game. I mean, for Mo World of Warcraft, for me, it's not the game. It's the people I played with. I would agree. I agree. That. 100%. But I guess that should wrap us up, I think. Uh, because for one thing, I have to go get some food. Um, I'm very hungry. I've had a nothing but two oranges today. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, either of you guys have anything further to say before we, we put this show to bed? Warcraft is the friends you made along the way. <laughs> it's been a long road. <laughs> getting to Ronnie's lair. 
Okay. Joe, could you do the thing you do? I will do the thing I do. Blizzard Watch is made possible due to the generous contributions at patreon.com slash Blizzard Watch. Your continued support means this podcast site and community is able to thrive and grow. Blizzard Watch supporters enjoy exclusive benefits like early access to the podcast, better chance at having your question answered on our podcast or the queue, and an ads-free site experience. Thank you, Joe. It's been a long raid, but our raid is finally here. Uh, if you guys want to hear us do this again next week, we will absolutely be doing it. And if you wanted to say, send us some questions, that'd be great. Uh, you can email them to podcast at blizzardwatch.com, subject line podcast at blizzardwatch, or you can hit up our Discord. We've got the patron Q and podcast questions channel for our patrons, and we've got the Q and podcast questions channel for our non patrons. And I almost managed to say that without stumbling. Almost. Thank you guys so much for being here. Thank you to Joe and Liz for being the uh, the wonderful people who keep me from crashing this ship into the rocks each and every week. Um, this has been the Blizzard Watch Podcast. We'll be here next week. Come on back. <laughs>